Sydney is a heavily interconnected city. The city has a massive 217 kilometers of motorways, controlled access highways that do not permit at-grade intersections and traffic lights, free-flowing traffic, ease of travel, allowing millions across the city to get around every day. But there's a catch. Sydney's motorways are not free. Out of the 217 kilometers of motorways that take commuters around our massive city, a shocking 145 of those are tolled. That is to say, it is impossible to drive on more than 67% of the Sydney motorway network without paying. Tolls are out of control at the moment, in the most tolled city on the face of the earth. Cost of living is one of the most important issues in the upcoming New South Wales state election, and both sides of the government have promised to try and reform Sydney's toll problem. But this isn't a problem with a simple solution. Motorists all across Sydney have felt their wallets crunch for years as tolls go up in price. But that money isn't going into the coffers of the government. It's all going to one massive private company, the true winner in all of this. So how did we get here? I'm Sharath and welcome to Building Beautifully. Before I continue, massive shout out to my monthly Kofi supporters. Please do consider supporting me over on Kofi if you can. Also, please subscribe if you haven't already. And do be sure to check out the rest of my channel, your go-to YouTube destination for all things city planning, after the video. The first toll road to open in Australia was not even a motorway, but rather just Parramatta Road, which linked Sydney to Parramatta in 1811. The Sydney Harbour Bridge followed in 1932. Clearly, toll roads aren't really anything new in Sydney. After all, the former F3 and F6 freeways, both constructed between the 60s and the 90s, were paid off by tolls. You see, tolls aren't innately evil. Tolls allow governments to recoup the costs of constructing massive infrastructure projects. These are projects that they otherwise may not have been able to afford to build. As such, these projects are built and in return, the public gets to benefit from the time savings that these projects afford for a small fee. And besides, tolls are never meant to exist forever, only until the road has been paid off. Toll roads offer massive time savings for commuters, letting them get to their destination faster. On top of that, toll roads get cars off local roads, reducing congestion and I'm going to sound like such a government shill saying this. Returning, Returning local, local streets to, to local, local communities. communities. I live near Pennant Hills Road, and trust me, the North Connects was a game changer for my area. These pictures from September before North Connects opened. Fast forward to today, and it's a very different story. The amount of reduction in noise was quite astonishing, so it's been fantastic. With all the trucks now underground, Pennant Hills Road is now so much quieter and nicer to drive on time savings and reduced traffic. It's a clear win. So it's no wonder that toll road construction picked up in Sydney in the 90s. Almost every motorway built since the 90s has been funded by tolls. And Sydney has built a lot of motorways in that time. There are now 217 kilometers of toll roads within Sydney's metropolitan limits, with the M4 M8 link as part of the West Connect project, the most recently opened. These are the projects that set up our state, not just for success today, but for generations to come. It's easy to see that Sydney has a lot of toll roads. But that doesn't tell the full story. Let's examine some statistics. The cheapest toll in Sydney is $3.77 on the Lane Cove Tunnel. But it gets a lot higher than that. The most expensive toll in Sydney is a staggering $11.11 which you'll have to pay for using more than 16 kilometers of any section of the West Connects. The most expensive motorway per kilometer is the Cross City Tunnel, which at only 2.1 kilometers, costs a shocking $3.10 per kilometer to drive on. Okay, okay, I know what you're going to ask. What's so bad about toll roads? I mean, it seems fair, doesn't it? If you want a faster journey, you can pay to use the motorway, and otherwise you can enjoy your slower but free journey. Easy. 
On top of that, tolls act as a sort of disincentive towards driving. Cars are expensive, they contribute to global warming, they take up way too much space. On the other hand, public transport is cheaper, it can move far more people, and it contributes far less to global warming. With all that said, I can now bring you to my next conclusion. Cars bad, tolls bad, so tolls equal less people using cars. Tolls encourage more people to use public transport, and they punish the pockets of those who insist on using an option that may be faster, but is worse for the environment. This is fair, right? Well, I just don't think it's as simple as that. Let me give you the example of someone who lives in Marsden Park and works in Mascot. By public transport, this will require the 748 bus to Schofield, a T1 train to Redfern, and then the 305 bus to Mascot. A journey that takes two hours. Let's compare that to driving. You'd have to take part of the M7 and then the West Connects, but you'll only take about 40 minutes to an hour. What's the cost difference here? Well, by public transport you'll pay $10.29 for this trip, and by motorway you'll pay $14.66. Factoring in the weekly travel cap on public transport, and assuming a 5 day work week, you'll pay only $50 for public transport, but nearly $146.60 for taking the motorway. So either you face a cheap but lengthy 4 hour commute time, or you are forced to fork out almost $150 a week just to drive to work. Assuming a 45 week year, 5 days a week, this toll journey will cost $6,183 a year, an eye-watering amount of money for anyone. Of course, you could just drive the toll-free route, but that's still a 3 hour round trip. Many will choose the tolled option, even if they can barely afford it. This problem largely arises due to the inefficiencies of Sydney's public transport network. Poor planning decisions in Sydney have only pushed everything further and further and further apart, forcing people into public transport deserts like Marsden Park, where the significant public transport journey times leave people with virtually no choice but to succumb to car usage, and therefore tolls. For it isn't those who live in the public transport dense areas of Rhodes and Chatswood and Green Square who are using toll roads. It's those who simply feel that they have no choice. It's those who live in the public transport deficient Western Sydney. 17 of the top 20 Sydney postcodes that have applied for toll relief are located in Western Sydney. These are people who, as it is, cannot afford to live closer to work and on top of that, must suffer the added financial burden of tolls. But it isn't just household budgets that should be considered. Freight is a necessary part of our economy and its transport demands trucks. Trucks that need to use toll roads. Trucks have to pay three times as much as a car to use toll roads and freight companies simply aren't made out of money. Indeed, in May 2021, the freight company Toll, ironically enough, told their drivers to not use toll roads unless authorised to do so, citing in a document that, in most cases, the cost of the toll roads outweighs any benefit we receive from using them. As it is, toll road patronage forecasts in Sydney are often far too optimistic. Take the Cross City Tunnel, for example, a well-known toll road failure. Its owners have gone into receivership not once, but twice, due to its low traffic volumes. I mean, come on, who in their right state of mind wants to pay $6.50 for a two minute drive? A study of five Australian toll roads found that, on average, actual traffic volumes were found to be 45% below the forecast levels in their first year of operation. Simply put, tolls dissuade many motorists from motorways. Indeed, a parliamentary inquiry into Sydney's toll roads found that of those who identified as infrequent users of toll roads, 79% do not use toll roads because they were too expensive. As a result, congestion often remains on the untold roads, albeit to varying degrees. This all therefore negates one of the primary benefits of toll roads, reducing congestion on local roads. But then at the same time, we have toll roads that are too heavily used. 
Take the M7 Westlink, for example, which I frequently drive on. If you use the M7 regularly, you know it's a two-lane crawl from Preston's to Bella Vista at almost all times of the day. Given toll roads are meant to make journey times faster for motorists, making them pay $9.21 to still end up stuck in traffic feels rather unfair. Returning back to the inquiry, among those who do use toll roads, roughly 40% said using toll roads saves them either no time at all or less than 10 minutes. Basically, toll roads are a dangerous game. Too heavily congested and motorists aren't going to feel like they're getting any value for money, too underused and surrounding streets remain congested, negating the purpose of the motorway. But it gets worse. I mean, of course it does. You may recall that I mentioned a weekly travel cap on Sydney's public transport network. Not only is there no travel cap on Sydney's toll road network, but it has to be one of the most patchwork disparate networks in existence. Every toll road has a different price that is not exactly based in any sense or logic. Some toll roads charge just 22 cents per kilometre, others charge $3.10 per kilometre. You only need to pay the WestConnex toll if you drive from Penrith to the city, that's $11.11. .11. But drive the same distance from Windsor to the city and you have to pay the M7 toll, the M2 toll, the Lane Cove Tunnel toll and the Harbour Bridge toll. That's $17.61. This is all a sign of a highly inequitable system that charges people different amounts for the same time benefits. It's just, well, unfair. I asked my viewers how tolls have impacted their lives. I can't believe how much it costs. My family spends around $100 a month on toll roads. I have been actively avoiding it whenever possible because of the cost, almost $20 one way. They make trips more direct for those willing to pay, but they are insanely overpriced and contribute to our cost of living crisis. As a musician, I need to get access to all areas of Sydney. From November 22 to February 23, I paid $621.47 in tolls. Some routes are now almost $10. Traffic through Epping is still heavily congested, despite the M2 offering an alternative route to the northwest. To be clear, however, not everyone hates toll roads. It's rather expensive on a daily basis, but it does get me into work and home quicker. If it's a choice between toll roads or no roads, I'll take the toll roads. I use toll roads daily. I love toll roads. Not because they reduce travel time, but because I love spending money. I am super duper ultra mega wealthy. Sometimes when bored, I have my chauffeur drive me in my Porsche up and down the M4 a couple of times for fun, just to flex my excessive wealth. Um, okay Rowan. A parliamentary inquiry into tolls in Sydney stated that Paying exorbitant tolls just to complete a day's work, access medical care or attend a study is an unreasonable impost on household budgets that are already stretched by mounting cost of living pressures. So it's no wonder that tolls have emerged as a key battleground issue in the upcoming New South Wales state election, with both Labour and Liberal vowing to do something about them. It's a secret tax on the families of Western Sydney in particular, and every time that ding goes off in your car, that's a tax that Dominic Perrottet is levelling against the families of Western Sydney. Under Labor, you wouldn't have those roads, and we know that. Still haven't asked the Shadow Transport Minister, do they still oppose the West Connects? In January 2023, current Liberal Premier Dominic Perrottet launched a $500 million toll subsidy that will pay motorists back 40% of tolls that they have paid in a given year with a maximum of $750 being paid back. This is good, this is good. This is the most significant support when it comes to toll relief for families in the history of the state. But Labor opposition leader Chris Minns has announced an even bolder plan, a $60 weekly toll cap on the entire network, commencing in 2024. And that would be on top of Dominic Perrottet's current subsidies. And it's targeted to those that use their car every single day and are not serviced by public transport routes. Short-term help for those who need it most. 
which is better? Well, let's look at that $6,183 figure. Perite's plan will bring that down to $5,433, whilst Min's plan will bring it down to just $1,950. Keep in mind, Labors only helps those who spend more than $60 a week, which is only those who are absolutely worst off. But that's probably the point. This scenario does paint Mins as the winner. Although, do keep in mind that Dominic Perrottet's proposal isn't his final one. He's insisted that the government will come up with a more substantial toll reform after they win the election. Well, if they win the election. Honestly, I'm not here to tell you who to vote for. I strive to be as politically neutral as I can on this channel. I really just want my viewers to have all the facts when it comes to toll roads. That said, I will say this. There is a massive caveat. Caveat? Caveat? Hey Google, how do you say caveat? That's pronounced caveat. Okay, caveat. There is a massive caveat to both Perite and Min's proposals. You see, Sydney's toll network cannot be simply reformed with the flick of a wand, for one simple reason. There is a detail that I've left out this entire time. Those of you who aren't familiar with Sydney probably assume that these tolls are being paid back to the government. After all, aren't they the ones who built the road? Well, no. Because now we arrive at the chapter in this video that will truly let you understand how Sydney got into this mess and why getting out of it isn't as simple as making every toll road have the same charge per kilometre or just introducing a weekly travel cap or any of that. Because the government doesn't own most of Sydney's toll roads. One company does. One private company. Transurban. Pretty much all of Sydney's motorways have, in recent years, been built by the private sector through what is known as public-private partnerships, or PPPs. And this does make some economic sense. As this report puts it, toll roads have been a response to government's desire to improve infrastructure through participation of the private sector, given a lack of public sector money, with this being a solution that could self-finance itself. This serves to remove debt from state government accounts. Let's take the recent WestConnex project, for example, a project that cost $16.8 billion to construct. Rather than the government fund all of this, the project was funded by a mixture of loans from the government and from the private sector, to be repaid by selling the motorway at the end of its construction. Whoever bought the motorway would then recoup their costs of buying it by charging a toll. Look, that's an oversimplification, but that's pretty much how it works in a nutshell. As a result, the government pays far less for the project than they otherwise would, and therefore they take on little project risk. This is a user pay model. The taxpayer doesn't pay for the road, but rather those that will use the road pay for the road. Seems more than fair. Furthermore, engaging the private sector creates an incentive for each competing consortium to develop the most innovative and cost-effective designs to maximise their chances of being chosen to construct the project. And that is a win. What isn't a win, however, is the system that has resulted from all of this. Transurban has slowly become the owner of all but two of the tolled motorways in Sydney, meaning that the company and their investors receive all of the money from pretty much every toll that is paid across the city. Every time you pay a toll, your money goes to Transurban, not to the government. Independent journalist Michael West of Michael West Media made an excellent video on the Transurban monopoly, which I'd highly recommend checking out. If you're thinking about the Monopoly board, you're in a game of Monopoly, these guys are like sitting on every prime utility and bit of real estate. And the poor old motorists, as they're moving around the board, throwing the dice, They've got little choice but to use these roads or make their travel time a lot longer. It's like just hoping you, you, you land on community chest or charts or you've got to get out of jail free card because everywhere else you go, you're going to be paying these tolls. This is why our network is so patchy, so inequitable, so messy. This is why we haven't been able to come up with a uniform per kilometre toll or a toll cap or any of that because the government is at the mercy of rigid contracts they've signed over the years. They are at the mercy of Transurban. So when you now go back and have a look at the government's toll reform proposals, 
They seem rather foolish. Both Liberal and Labour will pay for their toll reform schemes with taxpayer dollars. That is to say, road users will pay Transurban to use the road, and then taxpayer money will be paid back to them by the government. In this scenario, at least the commuter gets some money back. But the taxpayer loses out. And that makes no sense, because one of the supposed benefits of PPPs is based around the user pay model. Only those who will use the road have to pay for it. Except, if the government is going to use taxpayer money to subsidise tolls, taxpayers are basically paying for the road instead. In fact, really, Transurban are the biggest winners here, as the government are pretty much now going to be paying people to use Transurban's tolled motorways. Do you see the problem? Don't you see it? Because of the complicated contracts that the government has engaged in with Transurban over the years, both the Liberal and Labour, mind you, they're unable to untangle the patchy network that has resulted. To my surprise, I found a telling sentence in a report that Transurban released in response to the parliamentary tolling inquiry and the inequitable system that charges inconsistent per kilometre rates. Transurban welcomes the opportunity to engage with policymakers to consider potential changes to the tolling regimes and the needs of all stakeholder groups in order to deliver a fairer and better outcome for customers and communities. Look, my inner cynic would warn that Transurban saying that they will engage and Transurban actually engaging are two completely different things. But yes, taken at face value, this is at least something. In the meantime, I do think that the government subsidy programs are the best solution, but purely because there's just no better choice. Trying to achieve network-wide reform with Transurban will likely take years of negotiation, and honestly, it may never be achieved. Transurban will be the main winners from the taxpayer subsidies, but at least the thousands of commuters that struggle with tolls every day will be able to afford tolls. That said, there are better long-term sustainable solutions to tolls that I can think of. More needs to be done to create alternatives to toll roads. We need to invest more than ever before in public transport, especially in a world that is moving away from the car centricity of yesteryear. If you drive and pay tolls instead of taking public transport, don't feel shamed. It's probably not your fault. Sydney is a city that's been designed to encourage driving. It's not just on you to change your habits, but rather it's on city planners. Someone living in Marsden Park shouldn't feel the need to have to drive all the way to Mascot every day. They should have access to better public transport options, such as a metro that will get them to Mascot faster. Or even better, we can create work closer to where people live, which we will achieve through decentralisation. Someone living in Marsden Park could have access to jobs closer than Mascot, in new hubs like Parramatta and Bradfield, that mean they don't need to travel so far to get to work. These are all very idealistic, big picture ways of solving the burden of toll roads, but they're necessary. Sydney is one of the most tolled cities on the planet, and tragically, this is something that won't change for years to come. There is no easy solution to Sydney's toll road mess. Tolls are just simply something that we as Sydney siders must accept as part of the increasingly expensive reality that we live in. Thank you for watching.